Welcome to our 10th in the series of Rare Webinars. I'm Nicola Miller, co-founder and creative director at Rare Revolution magazine, and in the background working on the tech today is my colleague Becky Pender. As many of you know, if you follow our channels, I'm an absolute passionate advocate for this topic of burnout, and I'm really pleased that you're here joining us today. Not only do I have my full-time role at Rare Rev, but I also run a rare disease charity with Global Reach, while also being a full-time mum to two young boys, uh, one of whom has a rare disease. Therefore, burnout is really something that I'm acutely aware of and really something I guess I'm uh, aware of that personal risk to me, but something I feel I probably sail a little bit close to myself. It's therefore a really personal and professional honour for me to be able to bring this topic to the Rare Webinar platform. Today's panellists and I see advocacy burnout as something that is really um, uh, a real threat to the ecosystem within the rare disease today and something that needs immediate recognition, but more importantly than that, it needs action. So not just talking about, but action and solutions. So I hope today's session is gonna take us through that and, and get to a point where we can start to think ahead to what the solutions might be. I'm really incredibly honored to introduce a very special panel today who are gonna help me unpick this topic and we're gonna look ahead and work together to find what those solutions might be. And I hope that you'll engage by using the questions um, function to, to really interact with today's session. So please join me in welcoming Shirlene Badger, Global Patient Advocacy Leader, Illumina Incorporated, Dan Louie, Chief Executive at the Cure for Action and TASACS Foundation, known as CATS, and Head of Business Development and Patient Advocacy and Pulse InfoFrame, Helen Bedford-Gay, co-founder of FOP Friends, a patient charity who support families and raise funds for research in FOP, and Kim Winter, founder and CEO at Rare Minds, who in partnership with patient organisations deliver counselling services, workshops and psychoeducational resources to patient communities. Hello and welcome all. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate that. Um, Helen, if you're able, you can turn your, your camera on now so we can see you. Um, so I always like to start these webinars by really going back to basics. So Kim, can you set the scene for us? What actually is burnout? And what are the warning signs that us, you know, we can look out for in ourselves and in others that are around us? Oh, if you just turn off your mute as well, Kim. Oh, thanks very much, Nicola. A really good place <laughs> to start. What is burnout? So I think we often think about burnout once it's happened, but of course, burnout is something that happens over time. And it's something that usually happens incrementally. And I think probably all of us on this call and those listening to, to this webinar will also be aware that burnout is something you often move up towards and then you might move away from. You might start to get some warning signs and then you pull back. But we're all at risk of it at any point, particularly in this area and in, in the rare disease community in particular, I think, too. So how you sort of show signs of burnout is always very personal to you as a, an individual, but it's often a mixture of physical and emotional kind of experiences, really. I like to think of it as rather than, than symptoms. But it's often that feeling of sort of having had enough of being emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted, depleted. You might find it difficult to be making decisions clearly. You can't think. You feel that you're constantly criticizing yourself. Nothing you ever do is good enough. I think all of us in the rare disease space know that feeling of there's always something else we should be doing. And of course, that's always the conditions that can tip you forward in, into burnout. Some people experience it very physically. You might start getting more headaches, more tummy aches, or I think particularly when you're living with any sort of health problem, your symptoms might start to feel more difficult or they might actually start to get worse too. So sometimes it will come across very physically. And sometimes that sense of you just can't switch off, you can't relax, you can't sleep, your mind is always sort of active and, and engaged with the problems that you're trying to address really. Um, so it comes across very differently for different people in situations, I think. It's a very recognized phenomenon. The World Health Organization knows it's a problem increasingly. And I think particularly for those of us in rare disease communities, um, there's very particular conditions that mean we're more subject to it, which often comes back to not wanting to disappoint the communities that we serve because they know how much disappointment has been rife. So when you're a leader, you don't want to disappoint others, but that can lead you to overextending your own boundaries and your own reach in a way that might come to your own detriment, really. 
and and lived experience i think then features as something that is is such an asset and such a strong place to work from for so many of our leaders but also those identifications you have with your community members mean that again you sometimes might overextend yourself in a way that might not always be in your own personal interest let's say something i'm sure everyone here really resonates with what you've just said and i'm sure everyone listening and it's Interesting as well, in terms of, you know, a lot, of, a lot of those things are things we would feel or would be internal to us, but how might we identify this in perhaps a colleague or a loved one that, you know, what would might be some signs that you would see outwardly that you might recognise actually this person is overextended? I think that's a really good question because I think one of the difficulties that we have around burnout, but around sort of mental health sort of generally is that we are very good at hiding it you know we tend to brush it off there's a lot of shame involved in admitting to others we might not be coping as well as we wish um, we all want to do the best that we can we all want to have our best face forward so it can often be quite difficult to pick up signs from others so I think one side of that is we might need to all get a bit better at saying oh, I'm struggling a bit, or I can't think about this, or I'm really feeling overwhelmed. You know, that's one part of it. Being brave about our own experience, because that frees up others to speak to their own experience too. I think checking in as well, you know, sometimes if you're finding people are maybe not meeting deadlines or not turning up to things or forgetting stuff, forgetting to be places, or... Um, or aren't or sort of over promising sometimes as well. That's a sign that someone may be heading for burnout because back to what I was saying earlier, we all want to do the best that we can for our communities. We're all in touch with how much need is out there. So sometimes just sort of keeping an eye on each other is, is really helpful. Is this realistic? Is it practical? Can this person really, you know, meet these expectations? But I think often often we avoid contact with others when we're really struggling. So, you know, people who are going off the radar a bit or seem over bright sometimes as well, you know, a bit sort of coping a bit too well. Sometimes I'm always wondering, oh, you know, where's, where's, where's the conversations about the difficult stuff or, you know, how it's going in that regard. Oh, thank you, Kim. And, and Helen, if I can come to you, obviously you work tirelessly in a very small charity and I know that your, your experiences will mirror a lot of the people that are listening today. Can you kind of talk me through what your personal experiences have been with burnout? Because I know this is really, really topical and important to you as a topic. Yeah, so um, I came historically from a background of teaching. So I was used to doing sort of, you know, beyond sort of your nine till three contracted hours. So I was used to doing sort of above and beyond. Um, but there's a difference when it's uh, when it's set up a small patient organisation because of your own personal connection, either through a sibling or a, a child. Um, and that's how um, Chris and I got to where we are today. We set up the organisation <clears throat> um, when our son was diagnosed and this was where sometimes I stop and look backwards and not quite sure how I got where we are today because this was never part of our life plan and um, I was going to carry on and be a teacher and he was going to be a, a, a computer tech person um, and now we're here today so yes yeah, so and I, I think running at 110 miles an hour as, as, as Kim mentioned just then I can identify sitting there going through everything that Kim had said going through as a checklist going yes 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 absolutely identified with everything that Kim has said um, and when you're running a, a small charity like this um, you run it with your head but also with your heart and you're there because you want to make a difference for your own child but you can't help but become emotionally connected and involved with all the other families who are going through a similar situation to you and your head runs at 110 miles an hour you've got so many good ideas you've not got enough time and resources and um, so you try and compensate that yourself with your own time and resources um, and you do eventually just get to a point where you I can't do it anymore and you know the physical things you're just exhausted and just moving off the couch you know you just need to just sit and go to somewhere that's quiet and calm that might be watching your tv show that you've watched a thousand times before or going for a walk or whatever it is that helps you to turn your your mind off um 
and the physical I mean headaches now that I have are like nothing else um and I'm sure that is a result of the stress and just the burnout and trying to do too much and make the impossible look possible um and often when you're a small patient charity like ours um you set it up because of a family connection therefore you have a family and in our situation we have um Oliver has two younger brothers and you know, Chris and I are very aware of how much time we commit to um, helping Oliver, but then we also want to make sure that his siblings don't ever feel like they're not as important or that they're second to him. So you, you, in addition to that, you then go <laughs> trying to make a sure layer of guilt siblings. as well. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So you, you, you're trying to be everything to everyone, and that's just not actually possible. Um, so yes, yeah, so absolutely burnout um, is very much something that I am very, very much aware of and try and do something about. I, I don't think I'm very good at it. <laughs> um, well, it's difficult yeah, so when it's your life and your work, isn't it? Because there's no off button because, the, you know, it all merges into one, doesn't it? And flows back and forward. Absolutely. And, and you know, and I work from home. We don't have an office. So our office is our home and our home is our office everywhere around us is stuff to do with the charity it's on the kitchen table it's you know it's just around the house so it can be very difficult to switch off um and some days you do think i'm done i'm out of here i, I can't do anymore but then you remember why you're here in the first place and you get up the next day you know and take a deep breath and off you go again no, I, I can really relate to that, most certainly, Helen. And Dan, obviously, like me, you run a charity and have a full-time job, so, you know, as well as a young family. So how does this play in your life? You know, what's your living experience around this? Uh, it's huge. Burnout is this topic that's come up a lot, I think, in the last few years. And like Helen was saying, many of us enter the world in advocacy with no background, no plan to do this, and we end up in many ways, being forced into it because it's needed. I think from our, our position, when Emily was diagnosed with Tay-Sachs disease, a patient group was needed and there was needed to drive forward research and provide support. And we were so dedicated to her and her care and also the charity as well. I never forget when um, someone telling us that you only really hits you, the tiredness of how much you've been investing in everything after she passes away because she had a, a terminal disease. And it probably took a good six months after she passed for it to really, that exhaustion to hit. And one thing I learned from all of that, and I, I talked to my wife about it, is you've got to be able to embrace like the emotional range. You've got to be able to be excited. You've got to be angry. You've got to be able to be upset and laugh because if you try to bottle everything up and stay that stable individual, it becomes too much. And we use like the glass analogy at home. So if I, you know, I'm feeling stressed, I'll be... I'm reaching the top of the glass today. And we just need to have a bigger, big look at what we are planning in, at home as a family, at work, and also with the charity, because it's, you know, kitchen top charity starts from nothing, you build it up. And it's never going to be this big, huge organisation. So it's always going to have that volunteer aspect for me. So I have to obviously manage my time. And one of the big coping strategies, again, that, that I think has been effective for us is then always to have something planned to look forward to, both professionally, and personally, so the little goals, we used to do this with Emily. So it would be October, let's look forward to Christmas. What do we have planned for Christmas? What do we have planned for February, for March? Is it going to the cinema? So things you can actually, are attainable goals you can do. And we do the same with the charity. It can be overwhelming if you're leading a small group. Do you want to develop a cure? We all want that for many of these rare diseases, but to actually do that is huge, huge amount of money, huge amount of time, huge amount of networking. So we look at it in little stepping stones of what can we achieve today? What can we achieve next month, the month after to help us get on that goal of support and also um, finding treatments? And that also manages our expectations for us personally and the community and kind of keeps our anxiety levels <laughs> to a certain amount. Because it is, you do, you feel huge anxiety and pressure, I know, and we're dealing with a community where sadly children die. And every time a child dies, it just it hits you because you're like, it's another one. We're still not there. We've been trying to do this for so many years. But you then have to use that emotional side to power you forward. And that's something that I've learned. It's not something you can just, this is how I'm going to do it. You have to learn how to, to manage that. Um, 
And I think that having these coping strategies in place really helps because if you just actually take a step back and think about everything you're trying to achieve and everything you're doing personally and professionally, it can be so overwhelming. I think that's so important. And I, I know I find um, for me, emails is the thing that find really anxiety inducing because I picture almost every email in my inbox that I haven't got to as somebody like us who needs an answer, needs a problem. And, it, and it, it's so personal. It's not like a work email where you can kind of go, tomorrow you know when you see that there and it's a family it, it's much more difficult so I love that idea of having bite-sized kind of goals like that but also I love that thing that you said that analogy of a glass of having a way of communicating with those around you you know actually I'm I'm getting to the top now because I think we don't do that enough do we we just I think like Kim said it's like you sort of swallow it down you get on and it just builds up and builds up and there's no way of of doing that so making a conscious decision to have that communication is really positive sorry Kim I think you were going to say something there as well I think I was just touching on something that Dan was saying that I thought was so important too, which is, you know, when you're running a small organisation, you're so in touch with all the things that you're not doing. And Helen was touching on this too, all the things you could do if you had more time, more money, more people. And sometimes it's just so helpful to just sort of take that step back and say, but look what we are doing, look what we have done. We are in existence when no one else was doing this work. You know, sometimes I say to small charities, look, you have brought into being an organisation that didn't exist before you started it. And that in itself is such a tremendous achievement that we sort of lose sight of as we go on because we get so focused on the, oh, we're not doing that and we need to do this and we haven't done that. And, it, you know, and it becomes so self-perpetuating with that kind of downward spiral of what you're not doing rather than occasionally stepping back and saying, but look what we have done, what look what we are doing. You know, that's so important in in kind of, trying to mitigate that that you know lean into burnout feeling I think none of us are good at that quite British people are not very good at <laughs> acknowledging themselves and achievements I think Helen yeah no just agree with that it's it's so much easier to at the end of a day to reflect on what you didn't achieve that day than what you have achieved um and things that just you it's it's a you have to be take a very very active mindset to actually like reframe your thinking to say no actually this is what I achieved today this was a good thing um, absolutely and Charlene from your perspective um how does burnout affect patient advocacy in industry because obviously you're bridging two worlds here so you've kind of got the pressures from an industry side but also you're also feeling and living all of the emotions from the advocacy side so you're kind of in that <laughs> you know, the two tides coming together yeah I mean that's a big question really because uh, so the way that my team and I operate as well as you know we come from advocacy so we see ourselves very much as advocates within the company rather than you know patient engagement specialists so you know I, I don't think we're we're immune to to any of this and because of um the relationships that we have you know it it, it means it's like Dan said it, it's you know you're dealing with loss you're dealing with um urgency you're dealing with all of these things on a day-to-day -day basis um and I did just want to pick up what was just being said actually in terms of just um just a couple of things before I I, I kind of answer your question really one was that someone who I very much respect once said to me that we grossly overestimate what we think we can achieve in one year and grossly underestimate what we have achieved in 10 years and um, when I thought about that I think that's a really powerful statement but also it means that say for my team what we do um, on a weekly basis is we start our weekly team meeting with key wins now I'm not talking about key wins being whoa, you know, something, it, it might just be that I got that email written that I've been trying to get it written for the last <laughs> two weeks. You know, it's 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 whatever we feel is a, is a success for that moment. And when, you know, that I think that helps sometimes because the task is large. And um, what I wanted to say about kind of what advocacy means for me is, um, I guess, two things that I really think are important and I think are particularly important for us in the rare disease space. Um, and uh, this is partly inspired by a quote um, from Van Gogh of all people who wrote to his brother rather frustrated and said, someone has a great fire in their soul and passers by see nothing but a little smoke at the top of the chimney. And I find this quote really significant for two reasons, because I think this speaks to burnout, but it also speaks to um, a lot of things that are, you know, prevalent within 
the rare disease advocacy space. One is that we are constantly battling perceptions of normality. You know, in the rare space, we're constantly um, looking at the limits that, you know, it, the, we're pushing against systems. We have a perspective of what could be, or even what should be, and how it's not that at the moment. So we're constantly measuring against this idea of normal. And therefore, we're, you know, we often look at other people and we think, oh, they don't live with the same complexity that we do, or they don't, you know, by comparison, they don't have the same confusion. And, you know, there's, there's this kind of, so the smoke that we see is just, just this. But at the same time, there's a sense too, in terms of, um, you know, we're mission driven. We're in this because we're so mission driven. And that means that we have a particular sense of that North Star that we're aiming for. And this goes hand in hand with that advocacy work. Burnout is long, it's never sudden. As you've said, we move into it, we move away from it. The North Star that we're moving towards is a long-term plan, you know, it's a, and sometimes it's really hold, hard to hold that passion when you're, you, as Dan said, when you lose someone again, when you, and you know, I, I've had this several times, you get the phone call at the, you know, one time five o'clock in the morning to say um, a little boy had passed and it was just, it's that whole sense of, oh my goodness, I just haven't done enough. It's that whole sense that there's something more to do constantly. Um, and how do we, how do we keep hold of that North Star? Um, and how do we keep our passion when so, it's, you know, there's so much that we're trying to deal with? And in the rare disease space, I think that's really significant too, because we are constantly battling all sorts of structures. We're bringing all sorts of stakeholders together who have never been together, who have never even talked. We're, you know, creating an ecosystem that is evolving really rapidly over over this time. And and that takes work. And my biggest fear, I think, is what I've seen in myself as well. And, and you know, people I hold very close as friends is we're passionate people. But what happens as we move towards burnout in terms of that passion? And someone once someone recently said something to me about a graveyard of passions and I was just like oh my goodness that you know that's a real kind of that's a tragic sort of idea of it but it's kind of like how do we protect against that or how do we make um those losses something that can continue to fuel us and um to hold and us that's the key thing isn't it that's what we're trying to avoid you know that graveyard of passion we see it across the whole ecosystem and you think this is not sustainable and you know how can we halt this and stop what seems to be an inevitable <laughs> crescendo of burnout across the system. Yeah, gosh, um, it's, it's, it's very challenging, isn't it?